pricing is more challenging. It depends on, you know, what's being offered. But of course, you know, a discount to fair market value is a really important piece for driving value to our residents. I'd say as positioning, you know, where and when is that, um, you know, collaborating with the partner who we're offering and our marketing team to really get the message out there uh, at the right point and not to overwhelm them, whether that be, uh, you know, a whole bunch of automated email campaigns and things of that nature. We know that we don't have success there. And so a lot of the pieces that we look at, it's really important for the organization to embrace as a whole from a leasing specialist, from a maintenance tech, uh, to really understand what it is that we offer and what are the right times for everyone to bring it off, uh, to bring it up, I should say. Uh, and so that's a piece that we continue to focus on, but uh, I think will be key to our success is that uh, not just simply presenting an offer, but uh, making sure the organization, you know, adopts it and believes in it. And uh, that's how we can truly implement change. Hello, professional property managers. This is Andrew Smallwood, host of the Triple Win podcast. We've got a recording from an IMN conference event where you'll hear from Andy Propp, CEO of Home River Group, as well as three of the top operators and thinkers in ancillary services in the SFR REIT world, from Invitation Homes, Progress Residential, Home Partners of America. They manage 20, 70, 80,000 homes in each of their portfolios across a bunch of different cities and markets and get a little different perspective than just a third-party management perspective on ways to add value through resident experience, how they're doing it now, how they're thinking about doing it in the years ahead and the big opportunities they see. Needless to say, Second Nature was stoked to moderate uh, this panel with, with our customers and uh, we're, we're excited to share it with you today. Hope it inspires you to think big about what you can do with resident experience in 2022. I'll do a totally inadequate introduction of our expert panel here. And uh, I'm just gonna go around the clock here. So Jay Colesman, if you could just wave your hand uh, from Progress Residential. Uh, he's based out of Chicago, but if you don't know Progress, they've got over uh, 40,000 units under management, cool new initiative with PR3 uh, and getting into some build to rent communities and uh, lots of exciting news happening around Progress. Jake has been the VP of ancillary services there and has been a great leader in this space. Uh, coming next to Jenica Hunt, also in Chicago with Home Partners of America. Uh, and they have a really cool platform, over 15,000 homes uh, as part of their portfolios. And uh, as the director of operations, she has been tasked specifically with many of these national partnerships and ancillary services that they've deployed. Uh, and we'll have some great points of insight today. Uh, we've got Paul, who I think is in Williamsburg, Virginia today. Uh, I'm, I'm only guessing by the background. But Invitation Homes, which many of you know, uh, you know, leading the way at over 80,000 homes. And, and Paul has been uh, great there to work with and uh, really has a great strategic vision for, for uh, how this stuff all works. Lastly, but not least, I'm coming to Andy Props, CEO of Home River Group. And Andy, uh, you know what, Andy, it looks like you're only wearing a two-piece suit versus the traditional three-piece suit we see in person uh, mm -hmm. at these conference events. But uh, Andy's out of Boise, Idaho, um, and Home River Group, uh, the largest third-party manager now uh, with, the, with the recent merger acquisition of Property Frameworks, over 25,000 homes uh, managed third parties. So Andy, Paul, Jenica, Jake, thanks for joining us. And uh, I'm going to set off just as a, a quick um, way of getting started before I ask the first question. I'm just going to share, you know, a little framework of kind of what we're seeing and why this conversation is happening around ancillary income and services. And if you think about in the multifamily space, you know, you have all these amenities. And if, if you can't read my handwriting, just listen to what I'm saying. But uh, son of a doctor over here, handwriting could be better. Uh, we have amenities and multifamily has figured out how to successfully amenitize a number of things and ultimately get a higher level of rent due to those amenities. And then you've probably heard the word fees and the challenge with fees is that really it's very price focused. Most people kind of don't perceive that as terribly valuable, uh, you know, when presented that way. 
And as far as amenities, what we know about how people have been searching for single family homes is they're looking at what school zone, what zip code, what, you know, price range am I in? And, and there's not at least yet been the same kind of amenitization. But then we have, you know, all of these ancillary services that add value. Some people are calling, uh, you know, resident benefit packages is a term that's been hot. It was mentioned three different times yesterday over the course of different panels. I'm sure it'll come up at some point uh, during this. And this is really, hey, how do we, you know, package a number of ancillary services that add value to the resident and really define the premium professional resident experience that makes us, you know, known as a great landlord uh, and not an unprofessional landlord, while also finding by adding value to tenants in this way, there's also great profit to be made, right? There's value to be added to bottom lines by adding value uh, to residents and, and also great operational efficiencies that can occur as well for the operating platforms that are exciting. So that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Uh, it's becoming an increasingly hot topic just to see companies that have uh, people having VPs and directors of ancillary, you know, gives you an idea of where this industry is at least starting to go, but we're pretty early in this journey as an industry. So to get things kicked off, uh, here's the first question. And the first question is what's working right now? What's working right now for single family property managers and owner operators? And I'm going to come to Andy props first, and then we'll work our way around. But what are you seeing work, Andy? at Home River Group as far as ancillary services and revenue? Uh, what's working on, on the ancillary side? I one of, the, one of the initiatives I'm over is ancillary revenue. So I get pretty excited talking about ancillary revenue. And that, that's probably a really geeky thing to say. But we, we have a number of ancillary revenue opportunities that we charge. Um, most, most of those ideas came from collaborating with other property managers at NARPM, uh, talking to folks like yourself at Fil uh, Filter Easy slash Second Nature. Can't get I can't I can't get that second nature thing in my brain, but um, but you know that's one thing that works really well for us. So I think we have somewhere somewhere around seventy to eighty percent of our single family rentals have adopted the the second nature uh, program, which is where we send out filters either monthly, quarterly, biannually, or annually, and they they would get a filter. We would charge for that filter, get sent out. It ensures it's a it's. I call it the triple win, right? The the owner the owner gets um, knows that his filter is getting changed on a regular basis. The tenant gets to breathe clean air and pay less for their utilities, and then we make a bit of a spread there. So we 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 win, uh, tenant wins, owner wins. We we get very little pushback on that. Um, we we talked you talked earlier about resident benefit packages. We're working with you now to try to combine uh, the the second nature offering. With a couple other offerings uh, that we're that we're betting and putting out there, but we have I you know I track it. I've got my my spreadsheet right here of all the different things. One thing that we're we're getting ready to do right now is our our, our holiday gift to the tenants, which is which is another win win. Uh, we find local we find local companies like a restaurant, a movie theater. This year movie theaters are closed, so we're looking at maybe doing some bowling alleys. Go bowling. Um, and we get a discount. We buy a bunch of we buy a bunch of dis, uh, gift cards at a discount. We put it in a nice little letter, and we send it out to the tenants. They get fifty dollars in value. We pay twenty five dollars for that, and uh, you know we make a pretty good spread. And we spread Christmas and holiday cheer, and um, you know we get good Google reviews. We make some money. We help local businesses. It's 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 a big win. So that's something we're all working on. And our 20 some markets right now, it's a big undertaking, uh, but we are, we are getting ready to put that out there. That's great. Andy, thanks for getting us kicked off. I, did, I didn't even know there was a seasonal holiday gift at Home River Group. That's cool. That's interesting. Um, great. Paul, anything you'd like to share or add as far as what's working right now at Invitation Homes? Yeah, I think I think the type of initiatives that we're having success with, maybe not specific to any one particular initiative, were those things that kind of uh, touch on a number of different areas. Those things that provide for an enhanced leasing lifestyle for our tenants or our residents, um, and that's all often driven via surveying 
and input from residents. So instead of us pretending that we know every potential amenity they would like, actually reaching out to them and asking them what the value proposition would be from their perspective. Um, that also plays in, as Andrew just mentioned, to you know economic impact. That has to be both from a resident perspective as well as uh, any of our perspective, meaning we have to have a very strong value proposition that we offer up to each one of them. And then the third thing, or, or, or maybe one of the additional things would be, you know, items that, you know, not necessarily are potentially revenue drivers for us, but items that help us relative to asset preservation. So things that may be very uh, specific and required within the lease, if we can find ways in which to make it an easier process for our residents, enhance our offering, enhance the experience to them often increasing the, the length of stay that we, we see on, from our residents are all kind of drivers of that. And then the only other thing I'd add would be, you know, obviously I think everyone has much more of a focus this, these days on ESG and, and, you know, impact from an environmental perspective, which oftentimes a lot of these ancillary initiatives, you know, are, are valuable relative to. So that's, that's kind of a, a long, way around no, no one particular thing that's you know got a lot of traction but you know our kind of conceptual approach to any project we look at that's great thanks paul and we are hearing more and more about esg especially with capital coming to the space and, and you know checking that box is something that operators looking at and it's great to see how energy savings you know simultaneously translate a lot of times into uh, you know, lowering that kind of footprint. So that's great. Great point. Jenica, I'll come to you next. What, what's working at Home Partners? Yeah, so kind of like what, what Paul said along those lines, um, you know, first is you really have to listen to your residents, right? Um, so they'll tell you, you know, what they want. And they're not always, you know, they're probably not going to say, you know, I, I'd love a filtered delivery program, um, so to speak. But you know, what they'll say is something along the lines of, you know, they want convenience, you know, now they don't have to go to home, spend their Saturday at Home Depot, searching for, you know, that particular size and go and get it and bring it home and change it out. You know, it's much easier to get something delivered to your door, which I think, you know, macroeconomically, we've all learned that over the past few months, that that's a, a much easier alternative. So I think for now, you know, uh, listening to your resident and then making sure that, you know, you can deliver on that, um, you know, with your systems, your employees, um, you know, all working together to deliver that. So a lot of like, you know, industry standard things, um, you know, work like you should be charging, you know, late fees, pet fees, application fees, right? Um, you know, residents expect to pay those and then you know, there's things that add value. There's, you know, some things like utility concierge services and filter delivery, um, you know, some insurance programs, um, you know, things that really, you know, are a value add for your resident. Mm, that's great. That's great. I, I'm looking, I think Amazon's already been twice uh, to my house twice today and has trained uh, millions of us to, you know, expect convenience and uh, <laughs> door stuff delivery for sure. Uh, Jake, anything you'd like to add before we move to our next question of just what's working at Progress? Yeah, I'd say I, I agree with uh, sort of all the pieces that uh, everyone on the panel has talked about. I think one other thing that's very encouraging uh, that we've started to see is really um, recognition and interest uh, from whether it's vendors or potential partners in ancillary space of the single family rental asset class. And so, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was on the phone with a cable and internet provider and said, I've got 30,000 homes uh, or 30,000 units. They'd say, wow, that's amazing. Let's do a deal. And I'd say, well, they're scattered site single family. They'd say, no, thank you. I'm not, uh, I don't know how to touch. I don't know what that means. Uh, and what we've really seen is through education and growth and maturity of the industry is that um, a lot of those types of vendors and in, in, in partnership options is that um, we are now seeing as a uh, worthy of those types of opportunities. And, you know, I can drive value uh, to a partner uh, in the same way that a multifamily uh, asset or a building can do so. And I don't need a leasing office to do it. Um, our technology is at a point where we have a digital and automated experience, and we can really uh, leverage that to make sure that we have 
uh, you know, value add relationships for our partners and for our residents, of course. So I think that's one piece that's certainly uh, interesting and encouraging for the industry as a whole. That's great. Thanks for that, Jake. And uh, you know, moving to our next question, I, you know, in your answers, I heard a couple of points really to the second question is, which is what kind of trends are guiding ultimately, um, you know, your search for relevant resident value adds or the kind of things that residents are telling you that they're looking for. So the word convenience obviously came out and I, you know, that's obviously a mega trend that we're seeing impact, you know, what people want and ultimately what they expect. Is there anything else? And I'll just open this up to the group that you guys are seeing that's guiding, you know, what you're looking for or what's attractive to your companies. If, if not, then I'll have to call and tear on someone. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, just just more of those opportunities. I mean, there's things that pop up all the time that are potential ancillary revenue opportunities that we can charge, but they don't they don't make sense, right? Some people charge them, some people don't. We we've got to make sure it provides value. That, that it's something that we're not going to get pushed back on from the from the owner, the tenant. Uh, the, I, actually, the hardest thing that I found to get um, ancillary revenue rolled out is getting the team, you know, your, your, your own employees to buy in that we need to start charging this because it does provide value. Uh, we get way less pushback from owners and residents on ancillary revenue than we do from our own team. So you really have to kind of work internally to get it sold that, hey, this is something that does provide value and this is how. You can't just say, hey, charge this thing uh, because the people that are talking to the residents or the owner are the ones that need to be sold on it. If they're not sold on it, you know, it's pretty easy for me to sell the, the tenant Christmas gift, right? Uh, it's, it's initially, it was very difficult to say, tenants need to have a filter delivered every, every, every three months. Now we've been doing it since 2016. So everybody, everybody's on board, everybody gets it. We get very little pushback. In 2010, we started, we started charging a, uh, a, an admin fee for every time tenant moved in, right? We charged the leasing fee but now we charge an admin fee to prepare the lease, deal with all the stuff. And I got so much pushback on that. We've been charging it for years. We've probably made seven, $800,000 since then, um, uh, you know, bottom line. And now, now everybody, everybody charges it. They don't even think about it. So once, once you can get the team on board uh, and you can, you can prove value, you know, the, the thing that we're looking at right now is this, this new app. So when you, when you go into Albertsons or Walmart, you can sign up for rewards, right? You get paid uh, to shop there, you get points. So the thing is when you're paying your rent, you don't get that kind of benefit. There's no reward points. Everybody knows what a, a grocery card is, but uh, your, biggest, your biggest expense, which is rent, there's no rewards for that. So there's this company called Pinata that, uh, that provides rewards when people pay their rent. So we're looking into those guys, we're trying them out in some markets to see um, if there really is value there and there's potentially a rev share there for us too. So it's, it's a, a benefit to the tenant, huge benefit to us on a rev share opportunity. And we're slowly trying that out because it's, you know, it's a newer platform. So those are, those are some, you know, just things that we're working on right now. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure people are, uh, I, I see some eyebrows going up and I'm getting some texts about, Ooh, rental rewards app. That sounds interesting. That's new uh, for a lot of people. The uh, it, it, just to, to add to that, Andy, because you know, we've obviously worked closely with Pinata to actually develop a product for the resident benefit package. You know, for operators, you made a great point of getting the buy-in from the team can sometimes be a challenge. And looking at these ancillary opportunities, not just as what can create revenue, and not just uh, you know, what can check some of these boxes of convenience and things of what residents want, but it, can it preserve the asset, you know, or can it protect the asset? Can it deliver returns for ownership? Can it actually reduce time and admin and energy of the team, you know, that's in the field or the ones that are potentially interacting with residents and make their experience and their jobs better, whether it's reducing HVAC issues. In, in the case of Pinata, we worked with them on Hey, every time someone's paying their rent on time, they're getting a benefit from that. And we're, we're seeing actually, it, it's early, but we're seeing some increased collection rates yeah. as a result of that. Right. Um, and ultimately, when people are having hundreds or thousands of dollars of rewards 
that they know, you know, won't travel with them uh, wherever else they go, that, that creates, you know, more value and more relationship. There was a, a panel yesterday that talked about casual or positive touch points with residents. So many property managers get stuck with, I'm only calling or talking to you when something is going wrong, when something's on fire, when something's broken, when it's flooding, when it's, you know, when it needs fix. And, you know, where's that proactive relationship building, whether it's something showing up on their door, whether it's a reward in an application um, or, or a holiday gift, I guess, to your point, to really enhance that relationship with the resident. It makes you as the property manager more sticky. Uh, and, and renewal rates, we know in SFR, it's the name of the game, right? Keeping the resident in the asset, preventing the negative experiences and creating the positive experiences uh, that are going to keep them there. So cool. This is great. Before we move to our next question, if, there, if there's anything else anyone would like to add, great. If not, Jake, I'm going to come back to you on how do you think about, you know, what's required versus opt out or opt in uh, you know, across these kind of offerings to the resident? Sure. Um, so I'd say in general, if you're going to make something uh, required, um, it has to be something where um, you're making sure that you're really driving value for the resident in that. And so, uh, you know, examples of that, of course, is that, you know, through, you know, call it 40,000 homes, if through our purchasing power, we can uh, really get things down, whether it be a, a filter service, whether it be smart home technology, uh, whatever it might be, if we can be in a position uh, to leverage, you know, the scale and uh, of the organization uh, to get residents either services that are below market value uh, or give them things that you know really drive uh, convenience to the points that they made before, uh, those types of things can lend itself to you know call it a, a more of a required type format. Um, you know, outside of that, we're very careful about not you know forcing things on our residents that really don't. Uh, you know, drive value for them. Because uh, certainly while you might uh, make a few bucks in the short term, you will lose that to the point on, on renewal and customer satisfaction. And uh, you can make any service you want sort of required uh, within a reason. But again, uh, it won't be successful uh, unless it's truly something that the residents find value in. Yeah, that's a great point. Jenica, I, I know when we spoke and prep for this call, that you had a kind of a, a quick, easy framework for what's required versus what might be optional. Did, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So I think additionally, you know, if you have, you know, there's something that's going to help you control costs as, you know, the owner and operator, then that should be, um, you know, required. Right. And then, um, you know, kind of along what, what Jake says is, you know, if, if something's like got a perceived like a luxury or, you know, it, the benefit is kind of different for different types of households or different types of people, those ones are the ones that you should make optional. You know, there's things like, like landscaping, you know, I might find that very, like, very valuable where somebody who's got a lazy teenager, you know, might not find, you know, landscaping so valuable. And I, I okay, great. We're a big we're a big fan of making nothing optional because if you typically make it optional, they won't adopt it. Uh, I know if I went into a car dealership and bought a car, and all, you know the car dealership makes all their money when you sit in front of the finance guy, right? And he sells you the undercoat package and car washes for life, oil changes for life, etc. But uh, if if you went in there and said, "Hey, this is part of the car," and you really wanted that car, you're gonna, you're going to buy all that stuff, and that's. That's basically our take. We found renew renewal rates when people are renewing, uh, it's because they had a really good experience when, when they moved in. The property was clean. The application process was easy. Uh, when, they, when they got there, everything looked good. They got their key on time. Their lease signing was easy. And then most importantly, when they had maintenance issues, were those, were those handled quickly, right? And they were, were they handled correctly? And were we, were we, were we, was, were we responsive during that tenancy? That's where we see renew, re, uh, renewals go up, not necessarily based on what we charge them off the bat or on a resident benefit package or filter easy going forward. So uh, we try to make as much of it required because um, you know if we if we didn't, I, I don't think we'd get much signed up. You know, one thing is optional. We charge a we we charge a pet screening deposit 
or a uh, pet documentation fee. There's a company out there called PetScreen.com. They do a great job. We do that in-house um, and we charge a pet documentation fee for that. And that's, that's something that we get very little pushback. I think we could probably charge 10 times as much because people do anything for their pets, but we, I think it's a reasonable charge. So um, like I said, we found if the move-in if the move in's great, that buys us a lot of goodwill throughout the, the length of the tenancy, tenancy and um, our renewal rates are higher. If, they, if the move-in has is, is gone bad for whatever reason, we see renewal rates go way down. Yeah, to Andy's point, you know, you have to, you definitely have to be firing on all cylinders when it comes to, you know, movement experience, customer service, uh, maintenance, things of that nature to really drive drive your value and drive your renewal rates, um, like the stay. And then, you know, ancillary is like the cherry on top of everything. If you can offer them something extra or an extra form of convenience, um, and particularly if it's going to help you control costs, like that's great. And I'll add, Andrew, um, you know, some of this is driven off of kind of a, a goal at the end of the day from our perspective to potentially offer an all inclusive lease to a resident. So if there are requirements and there are amenities and, and it can be more of a cafeteria type of plan, we'd love to be able to do to that to, to leverage our, you know, denominator, if you will, for the resident's behalf and, uh, Things just take a little bit of time, which I'm sure will evolve into kind of what folks are thinking about relative to packaging and what becomes a referral, what's an opt-in, what, what's an opt-out, what's mandatory, what's embedded in your lease. So it's, it gets a little bit more conceptually. It's very simple. Um, operationally, sometimes the implementation associated with these things is, is a little more complicated than, than you would imagine. Great point. And, uh, you know, we saw early on when people were new to this industry and operators were getting in, things like pool fees at first were like, well, you know, <laughs> I, th I think we've gotten to a point where you just realize it's so expensive to the asset that there's got to be a, a pool fee, right? Or it, whether it's HVAC or some of these big, you know, ticket kind of items, uh, those kind of things typically get prioritized more. Things that are already in the lease, but you can make uh, you know, more, more effective or more convenient for the resident to do to help them be compliant. We're seeing those things get man, you know, made mandatory more. And then for the items that are optional, I know what we've seen as a best practice across clients across the country is, you know, if it can be positioned as standard, like here's what most residents do, there is an opt out or, you, you know, you can duplicate this, just sign an opt out addendum, you know, to duplicate the result on your own, we can give you a path to do that. And there's some services which our audience should know. It, it's like legally in many states, you can't require someone to purchase insurance from you. At least that's true for a lot of operators. So uh, certainly you have to make sure it's compliant uh, with wherever you're operating. That's an important point. Okay, great. Um, moving on here. So let's talk a little bit about looking forward and the future landscape, landscape. We've heard examples of different services and we've heard utility concierge, we've heard rental rewards, I've heard uh, I know smart home is one that's in the q and and I'd love to hear uh, thoughts from this group on that. You know, what do you see as just categorically the types of services that you think are going to define the professional management experience and that excite you to at least look at them or think about what it could be like uh, to be a resident in your homes. And uh, let's do this. Let's start with Paul. Do you want to get this one kicked off? Sure. I mean, I think it's ever evolving. Um, I've now been in the space for around a year and a half. And when we went through kind of discovery out of the gate, there were about 60 or 70 different amenity services we identified. So the question is how do you categorize, prioritize, and make sure they're in alignment with your, with your residents? Um, but I think there are, you know, a number of kind of core products that are relevant to requirements associated with a lease that, from my perspective, are almost kind of blocking and tackling that we need to be able to provide a strong value relative to optionality applicable to those. Um, and then, as you described, I mean, I think there are uh, a number of items that would fall more within the, the opt-in or opt-out. But as you described, making them an opt-in, 
until we're told otherwise. And then there's kind of the white glove referral type of items, you know, that, that there are just, you know, those are plentiful and those are out there and those are things that we'd love to be able to offer on a go forward basis. So, um, you know, I think it's going to become much more prevalent, a much better experience from a resident, you know, that that's, you know, working with any of the companies on the screen, just as far as their overall experience and the professionalism associated with, with this space. Um, and how quickly it's evolved into what we're talking about. Um, you know, we've been smart home uh, utilizers for a long time, started as a management tool, the tool evolved into a management tool with much more of a focus on a uh, resident amenity, um, you know, both from, from an everyday use as well as a, you know, utility um, opportunity as well for them. So I think, um, things are starting to come into a little bit better clarity for, for probably all of us. And, um, you know, with, with the scale that everyone's gained, it makes it a lot more viable in the short term to, to really, you know, I, I know, you know, one, one thing that we've tried to stop doing is calling things fees, right? Because, you know, if it, it just as a connotation that's negative, I think from a lot of folks perspective versus, you know, amenities or value add items that we're providing. So I think, that's the trend, um, you know, to, to drive it from a resident's perspective, but to make sure operationally and financially it makes sense for, for the operator. Hmm. That's great. Paul, thanks for getting us kicked off. Jake, let's come to you next. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the future, and I agree, I think Paul hit the nail on the head with a lot of pieces there, is that, you know, when you think about the ancillary world and services and things that might be um, offered, you have, you know, your handful of services that are for, a compliance, whether that's the lease and the property itself. You've got a handful of offerings there just for the resident uh, convenience, whether that be, you know, a preferred internet package for them. And then you have things that are sort of blend the two categories, uh, you know, like smart home technology, which can be convenience and also obviously can have significant operational savings. And so um, I, I think, you know, Paul said it well, is that um, finding that sort of right blend between those things and prioritization and categorizing them um, and really having you know, what we hope is, uh, you know, in time, uh, a seamless platform for those things, whether they be required or optional or opt-in and opt-out and everything that comes with it. Uh, but that's, I think, uh, a future that uh, um, is hopefully not too far off with a lot of those pieces. That's great. Jenica, anything you'd like to add on just the future landscape, what you're seeing and excites you as possibilities for services for residents? Yeah, I think, um, I think, the resident benefit package going forward. Um, you know, I think we're kind of very early days on, you know, what can we add and, you know, do we make them optional and things of that nature. So I think there's a lot of runway here and I'm like very excited to see kind of what everybody does. Um, but I think the resident benefit package, I think what we'll see is, you know, operators um, that have maybe several different options of packages. Um, you know, there are, you know, 60, 70 countless things that you can do. And I think looking at the combination of them, um, you know, and giving people that option um, is like really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, with that, you know, my background's in appraisal and there's an appraisal term, uh, assemblage value, which is when you take, you know, two pieces of land and you put them together and the value is greater than the sum of the parts, right? Um, so I think that by, you know, strategically placing some of these options together in different packages, it actually adds even greater value than, than what they are, um, you know, alone. So I think we'll see, you know, a lot more of that uh, kind of in the next in the kind of near future but and before i come to andy one of the big you know words yesterday was also connectivity right which is a, a large part of what's attractive i know to smart home which is part of the question in the chat and there's been conversations about how you know getting better insight and visibility in the home and what's happening and impacting the residents experience there that some of these ancillary services can actually connect to each other uh, to, to deliver service more dynamically in real time, uh, which is, you know, an exciting future to think about. So appreciate you bringing that up, Jenica. Andy, bring us home on this question. Yeah, what do you I see mean, for the future? 
I specifically, I, I mean, I think it'd be a great idea for somebody, maybe somebody on this, you know, out in the, out in the uh, audience or on the panel can do, take this and run with it. But it's something I, I looked into a few years ago. Uh, we, we used to have a thing called the tenant move-in guide, or we called it short, short T-MIG. The T-MIG was, was awesome. So we went around to local businesses and basically uh, when you're, we, we did, we did some research and we found out uh, the, the two biggest thing, the two biggest life events where you spend the most money, one is getting married, two is moving, right? So wh- why isn't there something like an app or, or something that we could offer where we could say, hey, you moved into a new a- area and because you're a Home River Group tenant, you get all these discounts at restaurants. Here's the doctor that you need to call. Here's the dentist, right? Lowe's 10% off, whatever. I mean, most of these people are moving from out of state mostly California, moving from California. They don't have, they don't have these, they don't have these uh, relationships and uh, you know, who else better to give them those type of relationships than us. And then, you know, I, I, Hey, if you're using an app, why couldn't you use that app to uh, unlock your front door, open your garage, right? The, the same, the same type of technology we can use to access the property for maintenance. I mean, so there's, there's a whole slew of opportunities there. Rev share, uh, apps, uh, home, home tech, which we haven't, we haven't done a really good job of. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but, um, we've had a hard time because we manage for third parties. Unlike, unlike the other folks on the, on, on the panel, it, we have a hard time getting the owners to want to spend that money up front, uh, to, to implement that smart tech. And the other feedback is everybody has smart tech. Now it's so cheap that, you know, you can, you could, you could get the whole slew of Amazon, uh, smart home tech for a couple hundred bucks and, you know, say a couple words and do whatever you want. And so when we start trying to get our, our owners to spend money to take advantage of that. Uh, we get a lot of pushback, but I, I think it's, I think it's, it's a great opportunity, but everybody's kind of catching up to that pretty fast. So uh, we might've missed that one, but I love the idea of, Hey, these, these are exclusive benefits because you rent from us. Not to, not only do you get paid to pay rent, but now you can take that money and go buy some stuff at a big discount because you know you're one of our renters. That's right. There's a there's a great distinction there, Andy. At least for the third party operators of just hey, when you're an owner operator, there, there's one owner to convince. You know, <laughs> if there if there's a hardware component involved that requires some investment and time to ROI, and probably it's easier to get their attention. Uh, to look at that than a retail uh, investor who has, you know, a day job and and this is something they have on the side, so to speak. That makes sense. Um, Very good. Well, hey, a a question I'm coming back to here is approach to pricing and positioning to residents. This has kind of been woven throughout, but just to make sure we talk about it explicitly, we've talked about what's required versus, uh, you know, optional. And the lease as a point of enrollment is a, a general best practice for a lot of these services. But, you know, for pricing and positioning, I'm curious how you guys have worked with your marketing departments of when are these things first introduced or disclosed to the resident? Does that depend based on the service and your experience? And, you know, as far as pricing goes, certainly there's nobody here charging above fair market value uh, for, for any service, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, but Hey, is it, is it at fair market value, a little bit below fair market value? Does it, does that depend, um, depend as well? How do you approach positioning, you know, the marketing of this and the pricing and, uh, and Jake, I'll go to you quickly and then, uh, and then move, move next. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I'd say pricing is more challenging. It depends on, you know, what's being offered, but of course, you know, a discount to fair market value is, a really important piece for driving value to our residents. I'd say as positioning, you know, where and when is that, um, you know, collaborating with the partner who we're offering and our marketing team to really get the message out there uh, at the right point and not to overwhelm them, whether that be, uh, you know, a whole bunch of automated email campaigns and things of that nature. We know that we don't have success there. And so a lot of the pieces that we look at, it's really important for the organization to embrace as a whole from a leasing specialist, from a maintenance tech, uh, to really understand what it is that we offer and what are the right times for everyone to bring it off, uh, to bring it up, I should say. Uh, And so that's a piece that we continue to focus on. But 
uh, I think will be key to our success is that uh, not just simply presenting an offer, but uh, making sure the organization, you know, adopts it and believes in it. And uh, that's how we can truly implement change. Jake, thank you so much. Uh, Paul, I'm going to come to you next as far as pricing and positioning. How do you approach that? I, I agree with Jake. I mean, I, we won't get anything implemented in the field unless it's a, a strong value proposition for a resume. The, the ops folks simply won't allow that, that to happen. So um, the value prop has to be strong. It has to fit you know, a need that's been identified by a resident. And then we will tend to kind of crawl, walk, run with respect to how we implement these things via a pilot, via do we only offer it on new leases? How do we roll it to renewals? Do we move it to existing tenants that maybe haven't subscribed for a service? So it's um, it, it's got to be overwhelmingly, you know, positive relative to an offering for us to to be able to push it through that process and implement it across the portfolio. Great, and Jenica, and let's see here, Jenica, I'm going to actually skip you and come back. So Andy, I'm going to come to you first, then Jenica. Yeah, I, I agree with what's been said. I mean, pricing price on on the on the ops piece, trying to get it rolled out, team buy in. Uh, you know, it's got to be a great value, um, and I won't I won't belabor that point. But pricing's tricky because you want to be careful. You're not talking to other competitors and and setting a price. You have antitrust laws there, but most 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 uh, third party companies and 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 sometimes some of these first party larger institutional guys. Um, you can you can go to their website and kind of see. You know, there's a lot of times they'll disclose what's going on there, and you can and you can kind of make uh, a good a good a good guess. And a lot of times that we've been we've been surprised. Hey, we think the price is this, and then we go check out the competition. It's usually a lot higher than what we thought we could charge. So that's that's been that's been kind of interesting as we look at new ancillary opportunities. Interesting. Jenica, anything else on positioning, marketing, when you're disclosing or enrolling residents? Yeah, I think it's really just being transparent um, with the resident um, as far as kind of positioning. You know, as far as pricing is, you know, the value that they're derived from it will help you determine your price, right? So if it's very valuable to them, then you can charge a higher price. Great. And I'll just add a quick comment to this before we go to the questions that are have come in. We've got a couple more. We answered a couple throughout all this, and there's a couple left over that we'll see if we can get to. Um, as far as best practices on positioning and enrollment, you know what we've seen is there's multiple opportunities in that some people operationally, you know, one will work better for them, or they're they're more comfortable with one one point than another. And let me just start with new lease. You're setting new expectations for a new resident, and so that becomes a very easy opportunity to you know start start things out. Um, and working back from there, when the resident would first see it, well, gen generally it's not at the lease for the first time. And so a couple opportunities before the lease might be the rental requirements. Uh, you know, that's a place to put it. The application can be great because for many of you, that's a, a static type of document where it's a centralized template. And so updating at one time, you know, works. Whereas updating listings, as an example, you know, that's a more dynamic update and, and would require in some cases, depending on your tech stack and what you've got going on, that might require human beings to remember to copy and paste certain language in time and time again, and, and how reliable is that? And there's a number of people who do all of the above, uh, listings, application, rental requirements, et cetera, and uh, you know, their agents or whoever's interacting with the tenants are trained. We've seen things like move-in orientation, which you hear coming up throughout this a lot of like how important that move-in experience is for driving a lot of outcomes in SFR that can be a great place. Move-in flyers and move-in packets are a great place to educate residents to a number of these ancillary services. Renewal being another, another chance, the renewal notice that goes out 60, 90 days before that, you know, that's a great place to introduce and disclose. So again, it's not sort of a, a surprise at the point of uh, signing their renewal and then, you know, occupied properties. That's, that's one that I would say we haven't seen, the industry really tackle effectively yet. 
of <laughs> where it's the juice is worth the squeeze of, uh, you know, marketing to occupied residents. Whereas you have this very natural enrollment point as a part of a renewal or lease process, um, you know, to leverage a number of these ancillary services at that point, whether that's voluntary and they're opting in, uh, or it's just a required as a new level of service to the property. All right. I'm going to step off that box, but hopefully that gives some tactical and practical things to the audience that I think they were looking for based on some of the questions and texts I'm getting. I'm going to come to the Q&A box uh, down below here, and I've got a question from Jason. Uh, Jason, good to see you. A lot of attention is focused on driving additional revenue in order to enhance ROI. Has the panel given thought to creating an ownership mentality versus a renter mentality? Is there a way to do that, you know, through ancillary services um, where renters are working in partnership with the operator, right? Uh, in such a way that it lowers operating and turn costs. I think there's a lot of people out there who believe, just to add some context here, that you can't get a tenant to do anything, uh, <laughs> right? It, there, there's kind of this pessimistic view, but I think what a lot of these ancillary services have proven is that actually, if you, if you make it as easy for them as possible, there are a number of things they can do or will do the majority of the time that prevents you having to send somebody out in an expensive way. So Andy, let me come to you on this question. Any thoughts on this one for Jason? I don't have anything on that one. Like that, <laughs> that never even crossed my mind. That's a very interesting question. Uh, but I, I think that would, I think, I, I never say no to anything. I think there's a way to do everything, but uh, I've got to, I got to wrap my head around that one, Andrew. Yeah. Andrew, I can probably speak best to that one. So, because uh, with home partners, uh, our residents, they also have um, a right to purchase the home from us. Um, so that, you know, inherently it drives, you know, that kind of ownership mentality. Um, so we see, um, you know, people taking just a little bit more pride um, in their home and things like that. And I know, you know, when we signed up um, with Second Nature, it's like, well, what if they don't, you know, what if they don't put the, the filter in, you know, because <laughs> you can only like get them the right one on their doorstep at the right time, right? But you can't like put it in. So, you know, our residents are, are putting them in um, and, you know, it's good for them also, you know, we hope that they're successful um, in their, you know, journey to, to be a homeowner. Um, and, you know, when you do become a homeowner, you know, you also have to take care of the home. So on your own, there's nobody to help you. <laughs> so, um, you know, something like that um, is like really good for our residents to kind of, you know, get that practice and understand that. So when they are a homeowner, they're not one of those that's, you know, why is my electric bill this high? You know, that they understand they need to change filters. They need to do some of this maintenance on their home. So, um, so that's a really good question. That's great. Andrew, I don't know if it's changing their mentality, but it's kind of, as you talked about a little bit earlier, moving orientation, education, communication, clarity with respect to responsibilities. All of those things will have the same kind of potential impact versus changing a mindset from a owner versus a renter. So just things that I think we focus on. Yeah, and I don't I've heard, uh, have to like have that ownership mentality is like, you know, for them is if, if you don't change, say your filter um, and your HVAC, you know, your air conditioning goes out and it's a hundred degrees outside and everybody's air conditioner is going out on the same day, you know, we can't get somebody out there like that on that day. So, you know, it's going to be them that's uncomfortable um, in the heat, you know. Perfect. I, uh, I'm, I'm just hearing Tim Loebner's words, uh, Paul, of, of working in partnership with residents. And a lot of people in this COVID era, you know, when when rent payments and things like that, there was a segment of renters affected. They've seen, I think a lot of people who had pessimistic views about residents have, have been pleasantly surprised is what we've heard from a lot of people of a lot of the residents are, are 
more well-intentioned than some of the pessimistic views out there. And uh, they've been able to work, work pretty effectively with them. Uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's key. Establishing that relationship as a landlord at the move-in, uh, as everyone's talked about today, is key. Ancillary services is just a part of that. All right. Great. Um, we've got a minute or two left. Any parting words of wisdom, anything we didn't cover today that you feel sh people should be thinking? If not, you can just leave it with a statement of how you see ancillary services uh, in general playing out in SFR. So Andy, I'll come to you first. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's, it's, it's incredible. Just, um, just talking to the, the people that do this business, how many folks don't take advantage of ancillary revenue. They, they just strictly live off, you know, the profit from the property or whatever their management fee is. And there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of additional services that provide value that um, I think, I think the market in general is catching on to. So I think we're going to see more of these, these benefit packages, uh, more ancillary services offered, more creative ideas. I saw something about, you know, package, Package delivery, delivery security, we've looked at that on multifamily. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there's something on that on single family. So I still think we'll see a lot more in the, in the future. And if you'd asked me five years ago, if there's, you know, our, we're, we're, we're about tapped out on ancillary five years ago. And there's been more, there's been more uh, that has that hit the market. So I, I think we'll see more. Especially, especially when it's so hard, right? When, when it's so hard to find a good rental uh, and people will, will, people are moving, they're not moving out. So they'll sign, they'll sign a, a renewal no matter, no matter what, because there's really not a lot of options. So people can, people can keep charging. There's a lot of demand in SFR right now. We've heard, <laughs> we've heard that a lot of times uh, from a lot of different pla places today. Uh, Jenica coming to you next. Yeah, I just think um, there's, you know, I'm really excited by the opportunity here. I think we've really just started scratching the surface and, you know, just, just think of, you know, we all have, you know, in the past thought about our tech stack, you know, very carefully and just think about this in that same way of, you know, lining things up um, appropriately and really, you know, I think we'll all kind of end up with some variation of something similar, but um, yet different, right? Um, because it really depends on your resident and that their profile, their needs, uh, their demands and their wishes. Um, and then you can, you know, kind of have some fun and be creative in, in lining up appropriate things for them. Great. Jenica, thanks so much. Paul? Yeah, no, Final thoughts. it's obviously a pretty exciting space. I think the next three to five years are going to be very interesting because I think folks are getting traction now and really putting some structure around what makes sense for, for all parties. And it is one area where from an owner's perspective, a manager's perspective, a resident's perspective, and, and a vendor's perspective, you can easily find alignment on, on things that make sense to everyone, which makes the partnerships a lot easier to get off the ground and, and implement it. So, we're uh, we're very focused on it and uh, are excited about for the next next uh, few years and in initiatives. Excellent. Well, we'll just wrap with this before handing it back to Sanyu. Uh, a couple final thoughts of you know whether it's a resident benefit package or an amenity package. You know what we see is people starting out. If you need your first couple of ancillary products or services to give, you're, you're probably not going to have one product and call it a package, right? <laughs> so get started if you haven't gotten started with, with something. Uh, any number of the ideas that were thrown out today can be a great place to start. And then once you start to hit four or five, you'll see, hey, four or five different line items of fees, it can really start to make sense to bundle this. And it feels like that's really the next chapter for SFR, which you heard referenced today and throughout other, uh, you know, conversations in the conferences, you know, how do we talk about what's the premium rental experience and the leasing lifestyle that people really want that's going to be attractive to the market? How do we make it such a compelling value proposition that it stands independent of rent, right? And it's not confused with uh, you know, rent. And so like rent growth is there and that's an independent decision. This is, uh, you know, something that you're getting 
alongside it as a professional service package from the landlord that you're renting from. And we're seeing a big impact, not just on bottom lines uh, and operational efficiencies, but when you think about every 1% of revenue in ancillary income translating uh, to a few cents in stock prices, when you think about you know, the profitability for third-party companies like Andy's of adding this ancillary revenue and profit and what that can do for your business as a sellable asset as well. We're seeing a lot more and more people uh, you know, look into this and really pursue this as a way to drive a great business. And multifamily's done it before. There's a professionalization of that industry and a number of you know ancillary services and product finding. And of course, with that, there's a ton of capital and vendor solutions flooding to it. We're seeing the same thing we feel like in SFR right now. So it's such an exciting place to be. Thank all of you uh, for your contributions today, taking your time. Uh, to share. That's all for this episode of The Triple Win. Thanks go out to Carol Housel and Jeff Tucker for everything they do to put these episodes together. And we want to remind everyone that you can find more resources, upcoming events, a link to our private Facebook group where the conversation continues in between these episodes with other professional property managers. All of that you can find at rbp.secondnature.com. Again, that's rbp dot second nature dot com. And until next time, keep transforming what it means to be in professional property management by finding and applying your next triple win. We want it to be true that every time we see you, we see a better version of you and your business with that. Cheers. Cheers.